Thanks for sharing these stories. I listened to them all and wanted to share one of my experiences. Please don't use any part of my name if you decide to use this. To begin with, I want to say this story is 100% true. I'm not here to waste time typing up a story just to get some attention. So my whole life, I've had paranormal experiences, enough to probably write a book about. But this one, I wanted to post because I was pretty shocked it happened. About a year ago in August of 2021, I started to get into Skinwalker and Wendigo stories. So I started listening to them a lot and reading also. I've known about these things for a while, but they never really piqued my interest until recently for some reason. So one hot night, I was up late listening to stories. I decided to turn on the ghost hunting app for fun, one that flicks through radio frequencies and puts out words. After a little while of listening, the app actually said my name as one of the words, and the tone of the words started getting much darker, which is not too odd, but it seemed a lot darker than normal. Finally, it came up with the word disembowel. I was a bit freaked out and didn't realize that that was part of the vocabulary in the app. At that point, I shut the app off because I was a little uneasy. Later that night, I went for a walk, which is normal for me during the spring and the summer. I like to take long walks at night. I live in the western suburbs outside of Detroit, so my walks are always throughout my huge neighborhood. As I was walking, I was coming up on a tree, and at the bottom of the tree, I saw what almost looked like a piece of really old paper. It was standing up, but the second I looked at it, it flew up and away so fast that I questioned myself on what I saw. As I walked further, I smelled something like rot or a dead animal for a couple of minutes, which is odd because there were no dumpsters around or garbage that I could see around to cause it. The smell happened a couple of times as I was walking, and I thought to myself, no way is there anything like a skinwalker around. It's just a coincidence that these things are making me overthink, because I've been listening to so much of this stuff. Over the next couple of nights, something started killing the front and back lawn. A big dead spot that looked like some huge dog peed on it showed up in the front, and these deep dug holes in the back, which I had never seen before or since showed up. Finally, after about a week, I was out walking late one night, when something sounded like it slammed off a screen door on a house with a dark porch across the street from where I was. A loud bang, and although it sounded violent, I figured maybe someone had just left the house. I saw a dark shape moving down the driveway out of the corner of my eye. I still did not want to stare as I thought someone was leaving, and I didn't want to startle them since I was out so late. As I kept walking though, I started hearing this strange moaning sound which was odd and still trying to pay it no mind. I now noticed the dark shape was coming down the driveway. It looked to be about four feet tall and so dark that I could see the white eyes and the teeth clearly. It seemed like it was kind of wobbly, like it was drunk. I kept walking without acknowledging it, and it didn't seem to follow me, but I was still confused and not yet scared until I looked back and I heard it making a choking sound like a cat coughing up a furball. I clearly saw this thing shaking each time it made the choking sound. It was about 50 feet away now, and I could clearly see it was on two legs and completely black, but it also looked hairy. At this point, I just turned away and kept going. I think by showing no interest or fear, it left me alone. And the only reason there wasn't fear was because I didn't realize what I was actually seeing until I was well past it. I didn't go back that way that night to get home, and I'm still unable to explain it all other than my sudden interest in these things actually brought one to me. I have not seen or had anything else happen after that night, but I did tone down my interest and use of the ghost hunting app. Another strange thing is, is when I look into my word history for that app, it never recorded the word disembowel. All the other words are there in the list. I guess you don't have to be in the woods or desert to attract these things. So be careful with your interests. Thanks for reading. I've been a park ranger for a long time. I've moved around between parks some though. I like to get the feel for different parts of the country. 10 years ago, I was working in Pennsylvania in the Michaud State Forest. There had been a group of scouts camping there and I made sure to stay aware of them in case they needed anything. 
I'd go by the camp once a day to look things over. I periodically would check in with Mike, the group leader, and confirm that all was good. But one evening when I went by as usual, Mike mentioned that some of the scouts had heard something strange. Apparently, the older kids had sent some of the younger ones on a mission. I guess there's some kind of tradition called a snipe hunt, where you get a bag and a flashlight and get sent into the woods at night. The rule is, you're not allowed to come back until you've caught a snipe. Except, there isn't really such animal in the woods. Snipes don't exist. I guess it's kind of a kid's version of hazing to initiate the younger kids. Anyway, these kids have gotten freaked out by something they said sounded like a really high shrieking noise. Some of the kids swore it sounded like a child. I was convinced it was just overactive imaginations, and maybe a screech owl, but these kids were seriously freaked out. They swore there was something very not right about it, so I decided to camp out in that area that night, and sort of keep watch and keep my ears open. I figured I'd set up camp in the same area of the reports. I got some gear out of my cabin, and followed Mike and a few kids into the woods. I went about a hundred yards or so before we came to the bank of a creek then followed the creek up for a bit until we came to a fork. I set up my tent and got a fire going. It was around 7 p.m. by then, and I was ready to hunger down for the night. I was hungry and was heating some food on my propane stove. But it wasn't before long that I started feeling like something was watching me. Now that's really unusual for me. I've been level-headed and not prone to getting spooked, but I felt really odd and uncomfortable right then. The woods there are thick, and there's a fair amount of wildlife, especially white-tailed deer and raccoons. I was used to the feeling of animals around. After I ate my dinner, I was just sitting by the fire reading, when all of a sudden there was this really high-pitched shriek. It seemed to be upstream. I thought it sounded like an owl at first, but a few minutes later, it happened again. I couldn't tell how far away it was, but it lasted for several seconds and seemed to fade in and out. I got up and walked a few yards into the woods expecting to hear the sound again, but then it stayed quiet for a long time. I've heard bobcats, owls, and rabbits scream, and none sounded even close to this. I stayed attentive to it for an hour or so, but I heard nothing. I finally decided to try to get some sleep, but I was restless and just kept waking up to listen. The next morning, I was making some breakfast and Mike came by to ask if I heard anything. I told him about the shrieking and said it sounded unlike anything that should be in the park. And I admitted to him that I was still having this weird sense of being watched. I told him that it was strange enough to me, that I decided to stay another night to see what I could figure out. This time, I decided I would try not to sleep at all. There was a full moon, and a lot of woods and creek were visible. Around 1am, I walked out to a spot to relieve myself, and almost instantly felt this really heavy presence. I stood completely still and listened as hard as I could. Then I walked about 50 feet when out of nowhere to my right, this dark figure with bright red eyes came into view. It was standing by the creek. I swear it looked like some kind of giant bat but human-like at the same time. And I'm totally serious about that. It seemed to look right through me and then suddenly it shot straight up into the air. There was this whooshing sound that felt like the air sucked in when it flew up. Then, a few seconds later, I heard another shriek, but this time it was moving away from me and getting quieter. I ran back to the campsite and got my notepad and tried to draw what I had seen. It had seemed like it was around six feet tall or so, and had these strange protrusions from its back that I came to realize were wings. There was no doubt about the bright red eyes, but that thing had swooped off so fast I hadn't had time to get a flashlight on it. If it hadn't been a full moon, I might have not have seen it at all. A big part of me wanted to leave, but I decided to stay the rest of the night and watch for it to reappear and make some sounds. In the end, nothing else happened, but that feeling of being watched stayed with me. I told Mike about it the next morning, and since the scouts were scheduled to leave that afternoon, we decided not to say anything to the kids. We just chalked it up to a wild animal. But holy crap, these kids weren't kidding. That sound was unearthly. I went ahead and made my reports. I don't know what to say, but I never believed in such things as this. But I guess we all get older and wiser, if wiser is what you want to call it. Hopefully someone will discover a logical answer someday, and hopefully I won't be here anymore. A 
first off, I want to let you know that I'm a big fan, and I've been watching your content for a while now. I've always been interested in the supernatural and encrypted hunting. There's way more out there than what the government or mainstream media wants you to know. I'm happy there's channels like you that bring these issues to light. I think my affinity for these stories began when I saw my first cryptid back in 1973. I was only 11 years old, but that day has stuck with me for my entire life. The image of the creature was burned into my mind, and I became obsessed with trying to see it again. Well, now it's nearly 50 years later, and yesterday I came into contact with this type of beast once again. I was born and raised in Albany, New York, and have always been curious about nature and animals. I spent a great deal of time exploring the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. We're situated right between the Catskills and the Adirondacks, and there are tons of trails throughout the area. I'm going to start with my first interaction with the creature. Then I'll tell you all about what went down yesterday. It was in the 70s, so things were a bit more wild and free. I would spend most of my days running around with friends and my brother in the city and surrounding suburbs. We would buy candy and play pranks on the store owners. Some summers, we'd stay over at my aunt's house, which was just down the road from Pine Bush. These summers were amazingly fun, and we felt like we had the whole preserve to ourselves. After what we encountered, I knew that wasn't true. The most interesting part of the preserve are the sand dunes. Now, we're right smack dab in the middle of upstate New York. You don't expect soil to look like a beach. The barren sands are often going up in smoke since they are so dry and desolate. But there's a great deal of critters living in these woods, even on the dunes. I went out exploring one day by myself because my brother was at horse camp or something. I was walking through the sandy terrain when I saw a dog on top of a dune. I tried calling over to it thinking it had gotten lost away from its owner. It didn't move when I called, so I started towards it. From a distance, it looked like any old dog. It was skinny and I could see the shadows of its ribcage sticking out from under its skin. It was blackish brown with these tall legs and a long snout. As I walked towards it, it began to growl. I started to see it clearer now. It had scaly reptilian skin. It was definitely not a dog. I was scared, so I backed away slowly. Well, actually, I think any sane person would do the same. It started to move towards me. It moved low to the ground and stuck out this long pink tongue. I turned to run, but never looked back. I don't think it ended up chasing me, and I never saw it again. This day stuck in my mind for the rest of my life. I told my friends and family about what I had seen, but nobody had believed me. They thought I was making the story up for attention. I never went walking in the woods after that, but for the rest of my life, I stayed curious. It wasn't until just yesterday that I saw it again. I was driving past a preserve on my way to make some deliveries. I work as a postman these days and take a few routes that take me into the more desolate parts of the country. I was going about 65 when I first spotted it, but then I slowed down right away. There was a dead deer carcass on the side of the road. It had been out there for at least a day. I would seen it as I passed the day before. It was bloated and very clearly a buck, a decent size with a pair of half-grown antlers. It had a bit of attention from bugs, but it wasn't in bad shape at that point. The creature was ripping at it now, and it was barely recognizable as a deer. It sunk its teeth in and used its long tongue to lap up the coagulated blood. It was disgusting. I looked at it in my rearview mirror. I just couldn't believe my eyes. Of course, this would be the time that my iPhone was dead so I didn't get any photos or videos, but I definitely know what I saw. I started to put my truck into reverse so I could get a closer look. I pulled back slowly, but the thing didn't even notice that I was getting closer. My windows were open and this smell of rotting flesh and sewage wafted into my truck. I tried to hold my breath, but it was just this terrible smell that started to make my eyes water. I closed them for a moment to try to push out the tears, and when I opened them again, the creature was walking towards my car. I sat there for a moment and stared at it. It walked right towards my truck door and just sat about six feet away. Now, I got a really good look at this thing, and I didn't even have a chance to notice the smell because my heart was racing so fast. It was hideous and drooling. Its entire face and neck and chest were covered in blood and the guts from the deer. Its ears flicked back and forth, and its back arched like it was going to pounce. Once I saw that, 
I knew I had to get out of there. I stepped on the gas and it actually started chasing me. I thought maybe I could lead it into town or towards the ranger station so someone could get a photo or shoot it. I kept starting and stopping, going about 30 miles an hour, and the thing was keeping right up with me. Eventually another car started to come towards me, and I flashed my brights to signal to them. Once the thing saw the other car, it ducked back into the brush. It was gone, and I don't even think that car even got a good look at it. I hope maybe they did so at least someone else would know what I'm talking about. My family is pissed that I'm back on this again, but I hope you guys will appreciate the story. Let me know what you think. Hey Donovan, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm going to be blunt. I saw an alien. I know that sounds out of this world, no pun intended, because I'm not some rusty old farmer whose cows keep getting chopped up in crop circles, but I straight up saw an alien more than once. I like to garden. The building I live in has a rooftop garden, mostly herbs and vegetables, because food is so damn expensive now. It gets pretty crowded up on the roof, with all the tenants who want fresh air, so I do most of the gardening late at night. I even made the super install motion-activated floodlights up there for me, so I don't have to worry about bringing my own light. I've been retired for seven years, so I don't mind staying up late if it means I get the whole roof to myself. Not too many places in the city you can go for fresh air and have the place all to yourself. Anyways, I'm up on the roof digging into some mint when the floodlights start going haywire. They're flickering like it's a disco party. I'm three seconds away from throwing my shoe at them when the bulbs burst. A spark hit me in the back of the neck and gave me this burn. This really put me over the edge because I was already in a bad mood. Some of the younger tenants in my building like to crack open a few drinks on the roof after work. Nothing wrong with that, but tonight they were being pretty loud and they left a bunch of cans in the planning beds and left. Total scumbags. I take my phone out to give the superintendent a piece of my mind about his cheap lights and littering tenants. But my phone just gives me this static and flickers on and off. At this point, I'm pretty sure I'm about to see a ghost because I've watched enough paranormal movies to know how this goes. But then everything just goes black. And I mean everything. The whole block goes dark. New York never actually gets pitch black. But everything around me was out. All I could see were stars. A power outage is scarier than a ghost if you ask me. So I'm pissed. The elevators aren't going to work and I can't risk going down the stairs in the dark with my bad hip. I can't even use my phone as a flashlight because that thing isn't working either. So I have to sit on the roof in the dark by myself. The air started to hum. It sounded like an old computer overheating. It wasn't loud, but it was everywhere. I couldn't figure out what direction the humming was coming from. Then a silvery fog surrounded the roof. I was more than a little freaked out. The roof always has a pleasant earthy aroma, but now it smelled like wet rotting plants. Not swampy, but cold dirt and decaying plant matter. I saw something gliding in the mist towards me. It was short, with a round head and a stomach. Its arms and legs were thin. These large black eyes looked me up and down like a Sunday chop. I thought maybe I fell over and smacked my head when that spark hit me. And this was all just a hallucination. Sadly, I didn't have head trauma. That little round guy reached out with a single long finger. I stepped back and fell into my own planning trough. The alien prodded me in my hip with its extended finger. Then it compared it to my other hip. Somehow this creature was able to tell that I had hip replacement just by looking at me. It made me a little nervous about what else it could see through with its black orby eyes. I got out of the planner and limped away from this alien without taking my eyes off of it. It did not seem very concerned with me anymore. Its attention was now on the mint plants I had crushed by falling on them. A long fingered hand reached in and grabbed a handful of crushed mint leaves. The alien's fingers sizzled gently, but it didn't seem to be in any pain. It just turned its hand over and analyzed the leaves. I wasn't interested in the spectacle anymore. All of this close encounters with the fourth kind stuff was above my pay grade. So I walked towards the stairs, but the farther away I got from the alien, the thicker the silvery fog became. 
I tried to walk through it, where the stairs would be, but I felt resistance. It was like walking through jello. The closer to the edge I got, the thicker it became. It quickly became too strong to fight and I stopped walking. My body slid back to the center of the roof like the alien was the center of some kind of gravity field. The alien didn't even spare me a glance. It just kept analyzing all the different plants in the garden. I had to just stand there and wait, not knowing what to do. It was surreal. Here I was with a species from another planet, and it felt almost comical like an awkward situation out of Seinfeld. Eventually the humming returned, and the fog retracted like it was being sucked up by a vacuum. The alien disappeared with the fog. I didn't see any kind of ship or spacecraft, but at that point where the mist disappeared, there was a blank darkness that blocked out the stars behind it. The edges of it vibrated slightly. A bright silver light cut on and then shot straight up into the sky, made a 90 degree turn without slowing down, and shot off into the horizon like a firework. I sat on that roof until dawn, not knowing what the hell to think. The building super showed up and told me that my phone had left him a voicemail, which sounded like sonar signals. I got calls the rest of the day from people saved in my contacts, telling me the same thing. I think the Pentagon should be paying more attention to this kind of stuff. How's it going, Donovan? I got a hell of a story for you. Most people don't believe me, but it happened two years ago. I'm a pretty heavy outdoorsman. Hunting, fishing, hiking, the whole nine yards. I even do some real niche activities too, like snake hunting. I haven't met too many other snake hunters. Most people don't even know it's a thing that you can do. Where I'm from, you can catch timber rattlesnakes if they are at least two feet long. Calling it hunting might be misleading. It's more like a scavenger hunt. I go out with a hollow plastic tube that has a mark at the two foot line and a pair of snake tongs. To put it simply, I grab the snake and the tongs, pop it into the tube, and if it's past that two foot mark, I get to keep it and make a belt out of it. The best place to find rattlers is in the rocks. Timber rattlesnakes are not as aggressive as their more famous western cousins. They are very shy, so if you want to catch them, you have to be real sneaky and grab them when they're basking in the sun on rock knolls. The trick to know is which rock piles get sun exposure at which points in the day, so you can skulk around them and hopefully get lucky. I was stalking all my usual knolls when things started to get weird. This was all on public land, in a state forest. I'm not going to say which one because I don't want internet yahoos traipsing around my backyard and getting themselves killed looking for what I encountered. When I got to my first rock pile, everything was silent. No birds, no bugs, no nothing. Then, as if a gun went off to start a race, three sizable rattlers came out of the rocks and hauled ass downhill. I've never seen snakes act like that before. They usually bury themselves deeper when threatened, but I didn't think I was loud enough to spook them either way. I picked my way down the trail in the direction the snakes went. I was careful where I stepped, because I didn't want to come up on those snakes unprepared. I'm crazy, but I'm not stupid. The trail took me up a ridge and down into an open valley with a creek running along the bottom. The creek was split into a fork by a large rock formation in the center. I stopped in my tracks when I saw at least a dozen rattlesnakes perched on the rocks. It was an absolute gold mine, but I was nervous about how I would approach that many snakes. Like I said, the timber rattlers are less aggressive than other species, but that doesn't mean I want to get stuck in the middle of a crowd of them. I waded into the creek and slowly approached the rocks. I was more concerned with being quiet than visible. I'm pretty sure snakes have a crappy eyesight. At least that's what I've always heard. I wasn't planning on being greedy. I just wanted to grab the nearest snake and maybe snap a picture or two of the snake party for my buddies. But then all the snakes lifted their head in unison and glared at something behind me. Rattles and hisses were all I could hear. I wanted to look behind me but I was also afraid of turning my back on a batch of irritated rattlesnakes. The sounds of splashing became close enough that I knew Whatever the snakes were hissing at was right behind me. I could feel hot breath on the back of my neck. All the snakes suddenly became quiet. Everything was silent except for short, snorting breaths, a 
of the thing behind me that was taking in my scent. When I was finally man enough to turn around, I got the shock of my life. I was prepared for a bear or a hog. Both of those things would have been pretty scary enough. But what I saw looking back at me was horrifying. Yellow slitted eyes with black pupils looked down on me with this curiosity. Its skin was grayish green and covered in rough scales like an alligator. The snout was lizard-like and filled with pointed teeth. The reptile thing towered over me, easily seven or eight feet tall. Huge black claws were at the ends of both hands, and they slowly reached for me. I panicked and flung my snake tongs in the tube at the reptilian, and then dove deeper into the creek. I half swam and ran in the waist-deep water until I got to the bank and sprinted up the ridge to the path. I ran down the path until my legs burned. I was back near the first rock pile where this whole mess started. I hid inside a divot in the rocks that made a crawl space sized cave. I could hear this creature sniffing the air. It casually followed my trail. A black clawed foot stepped onto a space right in front of my hiding spot. I could barely fit into this space, so I knew the creature didn't have much of a chance to get me. It stood there at the mouth of the opening, sniffing and lapping air with its tongue. The creature kept me there for hours. I even got a picture of its foot. I started to lose it. All I could think about was the scene from Jurassic Park when the raptors stalked the kids through the park. I wanted to laugh and cry all at once. Eventually, it just walked off. I stayed in place for hours afterward until I heard the voice of my wife and oldest son calling my name. They were worried and had come looking for me. I sprinted out of that hole and got them out of the woods as fast as I could. I was not about to risk my family running into that creature. Anyway, that's my story. When I got home, I hoped I was just crazy, and I wish I didn't have that picture I took. Then maybe I could tell myself I lost my mind for an afternoon. I can't stop thinking about what else might be out there. Camping is a big part of my life. I'm a Jersey boy, not far from Trenton, so most of my life is a congested mess of traffic on the Garden State Parkway and stoplights for as far as the eye can see. I love the city life, but it gets crowded. I need to recharge my batteries every now and then. Going out in the woods by myself is the perfect form of therapy. My family used to think it was weird when I would go camping alone, but over the years they've just accepted it as one of my many quirks. I've even taken my younger siblings out with me, but it never stuck. They'd rather stay home and play video games. No one else in my family is into the outdoors. They are born and bred city people. I was exposed to the outdoors after watching a documentary on Yellowstone. Since then, I've had an intense interest in the wild. Few people realize that Jersey actually has a lot to offer in terms of nature. The Pine Barrens is a huge tract of wilderness that is seldom explored. Whenever the city is getting to me, I don't have time or the funds to plan an elaborate wilderness excursion. I just run to the Pine Barrens. I typically go every few weeks, and I explore a lot of different sections each visit. I have a very detailed map of the area, and I mark off each section that I've camped in and hiked through. I was planning on stepping foot of every inch of ground in the park, but now I think I've seen enough. My last trip in the Pines started off as it normally did. I was in the southern part of the pines called Wharton State Forest. It was a favorite of mine because it's one of the biggest continuous sections of wilderness in the state of New Jersey. The hike in was beautiful and my first night I slept soundly with no issues. I made good time getting to my first campsite, so I decided to hike further into the forest and stay another night before making my way back the following morning. There are some great wilderness campgrounds in Wharton that are only accessible by kayak. I rented one from the recreational grounds and paddled out to the less traveled parts of the forest. It's a beautiful area with all kinds of interesting wildlife, but as I approached the riverbank, I felt like something malicious was watching me from the underbrush. At the time, I thought I was just being stupid. An experienced outdoorsman should not be scared by superstitious feelings, but alarm bells were going off in my head. The sun was beginning to set as I pulled my kayak up onto the bank and tied it off. I caught glimpses of faintly glowing eyes in the dark out of the corner of my eyes. I laughed at myself for being paranoid. 
I thought my mind was playing tricks on me. It was warm, but I opted to set up my full tent instead of just a tarp. My nerves were on edge, and I slept uneasily. I couldn't put a finger on why I was so anxious. Then I realized the forest was utterly silent. No hum of bugs or chirping crickets. I poked my head out of my tent to see if I could hear anything. A hot, dry wind prickled the skin on my face, and the smell of sulfur hit my nose. A pair of faintly glowing eyes peered out at me, low in the tree line. Some predatory creature was stalking me. I watched in terror as the eyes floated up in the dark several feet above where a normal person's head would be. The creature stepped out of the trees, and I saw its horse-like head slide into the light. I let out an involuntary gasp, and the creature's leathery wings snapped open. It opened its mouth and let out this growl. Steam vented from its throat, like it had a small fire inside of its belly. I ran for the kayak. It was a short run, but I smashed through the underbrush and cut up my unprotected legs. I almost had a heart attack trying to undo the knot that tethered the kayak. I pushed the boat into the water and jumped on. I was about halfway across the river when I heard the beating of giant wings. It sounded like flags snapping in the wind. The creature was circling above my boat like a massive vulture. I could make out the faint glow of its eyes and puffs of smoke hanging in the air. It dived for me like a hawk. I jumped out of the kayak and hung off the side. It smacked into the kayak causing it to bounce against my head and bust up my face. Some water must have splashed on the creature. I heard a sizzle like water on a hot pan and a high-pitched screech from the creature. It beat its wings and went back to circling me in the sky. I was halfway across the river and I decided I was better off swimming the rest of the way. There is very little current, so I made it to the opposite riverbank without trouble. I knew the creature did not like water, so I used the rope for tethering the kayak to myself. So I used the rope for tethering the kayak to myself to some tree roots at the edge of the water. I finally relaxed and just kept my head out of the water. The creature landed on a tree above me. I couldn't see it, but the sulfur smell and hot, dry air hung around for several hours. Eventually, I heard the snapping of wings, and whatever it was flew off. I've never been more relieved in my life. I made it back to the more populated area of the park, and some nice hikers gave me a spare set of clothes. I told them my canoe got overturned on the river when they asked what happened to me. I didn't think anyone would believe what happened to me until I came across your channel. Hello Donovan, I'd like to share a story of the paranormal that happened to me back in 1982 in Connecticut. I was working a second shift and I was on my way home about 10 p.m. I drove an AMC Gremlin at the time. Suddenly, I look at my rearview mirror and there was a man sitting behind me with no face. Where his face was supposed to be was just darkness. My eyes welled up with water, uncontrollably, as if I was crying, but I wasn't. It was true fright. I slammed on the brakes and turned around really quick in my seat, and no one was there. I mentioned that I drove a gremlin, because anyone who knows about those cars knew the back seat was basically useless. There was really no room, maybe just for kids, so for a man to be sitting back there would be impossible. I sat for a moment trying to get myself together, trying to justify to myself that it was just a weird reflection of some sort, so I continued on my drive home. I picked up the pace a bit and I just wanted to get home. I was almost on my street when he appeared again in my back seat. I slammed on the brakes again and turned in my seat and he was gone. I was so freaked out, I drove my gremlin up on my street so fast, I skidded to a stop and ran into the house. I never told anybody about it. To this day, I have to drive with my rearview mirror set to night vision. Whenever I'm alone in the car at night, I get freaked out that it may happen again. Well, years later, I was working for DHL, the courier company. In the early days, we drove vans that were only equipped with AM radios. One Halloween while I was working the day shift at DHL, I was listening to a local radio station, and they were interviewing the Warrens, the famous ghost hunters. One caller asked Mrs. Warren, what's the difference between a good ghost and a bad ghost? She said a bad ghost has no face. I got my answer several years later. It sent a chill down my spine. I've had a lifetime of paranormal activity, 
I grew up in a haunted house and I'm still dealing with it to this day. I don't go looking for it, but somehow it just finds me. We could be here all night with the stories that I could tell you. I think because I have clear audience, the ability to hear spirits, that that's the reason it's been happening to me my entire life. Thank God I have the ability to turn it on and off. If you would like to hear other stories, let me know. I'd be happy to share them. Hi Donovan, I came across your channel while doing some paranormal research on things that have happened to me recently. It is both terrifying and comforting to know that a lot of people in your world have had similar occurrences to mine. After binging your channel to find cases like my own, I figured it's only fair that I contribute to the channel and share what happened to me. Maybe this will help someone else make sense of their own paranormal occurrence. I'm a general contractor. I started in construction after high school and worked my way up over the years. I'm no master at anything in particular, but I can just build about anything after years of working on different jobs. I started up my own company about seven years ago. Every contractor has a few weird stories. Any job that involves working with the public, especially in their homes, is bound to expose you to strange situations. But few contractors have stories bordering on the paranormal. Lucky me. It started out normal. I was hired to install a new septic tank for a young couple who just bought their first home. This was before housing prices skyrocketed, but they were still very budget conscious. The place was an old turn of the century farmhouse that was in pretty bad shape. They bought the old house thinking they could use the money they saved to fix it up. I've seen this happen a lot with younger people. Trendy social media videos and HGTV make millennials think that they can buy a fixer upper and make it their own. They quickly realize that it takes more than a plucky attitude to do major renovations. It pissed me off at first. I felt insulted that so many kids thought my job was so easy that they could do it without any training. But then I realized how much money I was making when they found out they bit off more than they could chew. So I made my peace with it. Now I know what you're probably thinking. Creepy old farmhouse equals standard ghost encounter but I never actually stepped foot inside the house. I was digging in the backyard to install the septic tank when I made an unfortunate discovery. Bones, and a lot of them. Nine times out of 10 when you dig up a bone, it belongs to an animal. But if I'm ever in doubt, I call the police and report it immediately. It's illegal to continue to dig at a site that may have human remains, and I don't make it a habit of risking my contractor's license. The cops came. The forensic team confirmed the bones were human, and a special crime scene excavation team dug the rest of the bones without disturbing their placement. Over two dozen skeletons were arranged in two circles, one inside the other, surrounding a large elk skull in the center. The forensic team said the bones were a few hundred years old, at least early colonial times, but probably even earlier. It was clear that the burial site was not normal based on the arrangement of the bodies and there were clear scrape marks on most of their neck bones. The forensic team said it indicated the victims had their throats slit. The whole site looked like some kind of sacrificial ritual. I didn't think on it too much more. History is fascinating, but I was more concerned with them finishing up the excavation so I could get back to work on the septic tank and get paid. But that night, something strange happened. I knew it was a dream instantly which is strange because I never had that happen before. I was in my room, but there was no ceiling. I saw stars above me, but they were strange colors and moving around erratically. Then, an antlered figure appeared in the room and circled around me. He, or it, had markings all over its body. I don't know if they were tattoos or paint, but they twisted up and around his body in deliberate patterns. He wasn't showing any signs of aggression, but his presence was menacing. He just kept circling me. His face was stern but confused. Then, in the blink of an eye, he shoved me hard in the chest and knocked me back into my bed. I woke up with a pain in my chest. I shrugged off the nightmare, but I had a red mark in the shape of a hand on my chest. That was a lot harder to shrug off. The entire time I drove to the work site, I had a feeling of uneasiness. 
When I got there, the owner came out to see me, and there was a moving truck in the driveway. He was clearly upset about something, and I knew exactly what he was thinking. He said he didn't want to dig the septic tank anymore, and that he was planning on selling his place anyway. I asked him why he didn't call me. He shook his head and said he was sorry, and that he completely forgot about the septic tank. He looked really shaken up. I asked him if he had a nightmare. His eyes went wide, but he tried to play it off. We stood there for a minute in silence. I could tell he wanted to say something, but couldn't. I would have left it at that, but I noticed a bruise around his arm, like someone had grabbed him roughly. He noticed me staring at his arm. Did you see him? He asked me. Yeah, I responded. I unbuttoned my shirt to show him the handprint on my chest. He looked astonished and then oddly relieved. He didn't say anything else after that. He just nodded to me and I left. Part of me wanted to ask for details to compare his dream to mine, but I thought it best to let sleeping dogs lie. It might be a little anticlimactic, but the kid clearly didn't want to talk about it. I try not to drive at night anymore, especially not during the winter. Just something about the headlights bouncing off the snow that reminds me of the terror I felt that night. It's supposed to be a happy time of year. Everyone is warm and cozy and enjoying time with their families. I was actually coming home from our corporate Christmas party. I work in Farmington, Connecticut, but live on the outskirts. I'm just far enough to be away from the noise and the pollution. There's a lot of farmland and some people own property out here for hunting. It's a longer commute, but it's worth it to me. I've thought about moving back to the city. Maybe that would help my paranoia. I don't know exactly what I saw. I've read descriptions that are similar to it, but I feel like it's impossible to know for sure. It was big, way too big to be a person. It was moving on the side of the road, fully illuminated by my headlights and their reflection off the snowbanks. Its legs were way too long to be any normal person. Imagine the tallest basketball player you've ever seen. It was like that, but another five feet taller. The steps it took were so big, it felt like it could keep pace with my car. Of course, that could have been because I had subconsciously taken my foot off the gas, entranced and stunned by what I was seeing. As my car coasted closer to whatever it was, I began to be able to make out more of its features. Its muscles were huge, and its shoulders were enormous. Coasting closer allowed me to see its hands, too. They were the size of a large pizza. In one of its massive hands, it grasped something bloody. I couldn't tell exactly what it was. Maybe a deer limb or something. A white bone jutted out of the mass of fur and blood. Something red and oozing trailed behind the massive figure. At this point, I realized I wasn't accelerating. I was absolutely terrified. I couldn't think or breathe, and my brain struggled to figure out how to get my foot back on the gas pedal. I was coasting dangerously close to this monster, close enough to see the winter wind blowing its hair. Its hair was thick and coarse, like a bear. I went to a bear sanctuary once and had a chance to pet a cub. Its hair was so coarse and black. It looked just like this bear cub's hair, but I knew for sure this was no bear. Bears are square-shaped and have stubby arms and legs. They have a snout and little round ears. This creature had a triangular humanoid torso, and its limbs weren't anything near stubby. Its arms were as probably long as my entire body, and one of its hands was still grasping that bloody, fleshy mass. My foot found the gas just as I pulled alongside this beast. I couldn't jam the pedal down fast enough. The beast turned its face towards me, and I saw its eyes. They were these big, black, beady eyes. Its face was vaguely humanoid. The lower jaw jetted out several inches from its upper lip, which was huge. The nostrils of its small, flat nose flared, as if it were picking up my scent. It had a heavy brow, which its wide, black eyes peered out from underneath. As we made eye contact, it gave a sharp jerk of its head. Its body turned towards me and its lips parted, revealing these huge yellow teeth. I punched the gas pedal to the floor. My wheels spun a little on the icy road as I tried to escape. My eyes should have been on the road, but I couldn't peel them away from the rearview mirror. It seemed like the monster tried to run after me, but it soon disappeared into the darkness. 
When I got home, I could hardly convince myself to get out of the car. I have a small carport that is a few feet from my door. I literally only need to take six steps, but that felt like the most terrifying thing I could imagine. I was positive that if I stepped outside the safety of my car, I'd immediately get snatched and become a bloody mass that gripped in its massive hand. I finally got the courage up and sprinted to my front steps. I fumbled a lot with my keys and even dropped them. Every second my heart beat faster and my head swiveled back and forth, checking to see if this 12 foot mass was approaching me. As soon as I got in my house, I slammed the door and locked it. I shoved the couch in front of the front door and my dining table in front of the back door. I didn't have any weapons in my house, just a can of pepper spray. I didn't sleep much that night or the next. In fact, I've had a lot of trouble sleeping every night since. Like I said, I try not to drive at night anymore. I try not to go out at all at night. I put my trash out long before the sun sets, and I also bought a shotgun from a local farmer, just in case this thing ever finds me. I went on a camping trip with my father in the Black Hills of South Dakota. The first sign of trouble came around dusk. It had been a pretty warm day, so we waited until the sun started setting to begin our fire and prepare our dinner. Dad set the cast iron over the flame, getting it ready to cook the walleye we had caught and filleted earlier. It wasn't long until an awful rotting flesh smell overtook the campsite. At first, we thought maybe the fish had somehow gone bad. But when we checked the fish for a closer sniff, it was clear that the smell wasn't coming from there. We hadn't encountered that smell all day long, not even in the warmest part of the day, when you would think a rotting carcass would be at its worst. Even still, we decided to search the area for any evidence of an animal down and decaying nearby. It would be just our luck to have set up camp near a rotting animal. We walked up and down all the nearby trails, sniffing and looking. But to no avail, there were no rotting corpses that we could find. And even stranger, the rotting smell seemed to get stronger and stronger, no matter where we went. It was as if the entire forest itself was rotting away all. It was as if the entire forest itself was rotting away all around us. What we did find and found kind of strange were deeply embedded hoof prints that seemed to belong to a very large deer. My dad was especially awestruck by this, having worked with fish and game parks most of his life, and have never seen deer-type prints of that size before. We eventually decided to make our way to the camp, since we hadn't been able to figure out the source of the nasty smell anyway. By that time, it was getting dark out. The smell, of course, only continued to get worse, despite there being no obvious source. When we returned to the campsite, we pulled the fish back out of the cooler and cooked it up. But by that time, neither of us had much of an appetite. As we sat around the fire, poking around at our plates trying to avoid any and all discussion of the surrounding smell, I began to hear something moving around in the far off brush. Listen, do you hear that? I asked dad. Whatever it was, was sizable enough to be snapping what sounded to be large branches as it moved through the trees. Dad shrugged. There's nothing too dangerous about these parts, he said. He was trying to reassure me, but I could tell from his face and the sound of his voice that he was actually a little spooked himself. I thought about asking him if he wanted to pack up and leave early. I was hoping he would say yes, but we were both putting on a good act for each other of pretending we were fine. I was afraid to outright ask him though, because if I was wrong about him being afraid, I didn't want to look like I was wussing out on our trip. What the hell? My dad then yelled. I nearly jumped out of my camp chair. He was staring over my shoulder back into the woods. I turned, and that's when I saw it myself. At first, it looked like a dead tree branch is moving around from side to side, back in the trees, about seven feet off the ground. It was dark, and the moon's light was reflecting right off the pointed sticks for us to see them. One might have thought it was the wind blowing through a dead tree, except there wasn't much of a breeze at all that night, and the movement wasn't in any kind of rhythmic pattern. It seemed to be moving independently from anything else, and all on its own. Who's out there, my dad yelled. I'm not sure what it is he thought someone was doing to cause a tree to move in such a way. But what happened next had us both running up the trail for the jeep. 
All at once, this figure raised another full foot into the air. Through the darkness shone a pair of glowing yellow eyes. Only when the eyes came into view did we realize that we were staring into what appeared to be a large deer's skull with antlers attached. But it was at least eight feet off the ground at this point, probably closer to nine. We dropped everything and ran as fast and as hard as we could back towards the Jeep. We didn't even bring our gear. Once inside, we agreed to head to the hot springs for the night and get a hotel. We'd come back for the gear in the morning when it was light out. We spent a whole night at the hotel wide awake, talking about what we had seen and hoping that it wasn't real. Being a game fish and parks guy, my dad's initial hypothesis was that it was simply an elderly buck suffering from wasting disease, a sort of a neurological disease for deer that is common in the area and can cause deer to take on a zombie-like appearance. Ultimately, this is what we decided we'd seen and we figured we both just became spooked in the dead of the night and got jittery from not eating. The next day though, when we returned to the campsite, that hypothesis was thrown to the wayside. Whatever we had seen had found our site and completely torn apart our tents and snuffed out the fire and tossed everything we had on the forest floor. In the midst of the mess, there was a set of hoof prints at least 10 inches front to back all over the campsite. And that's only one set, mind you, not two. Whatever had been there was walking on two feet. I don't think we'll be back to the hills anytime soon. My family lived in a rural part of Illinois when I was around 10. We moved in with my grandmother because she wasn't doing so well. She didn't live too far away from our own house, so usually my mom stayed with my grandma and my sister and I, with our stepdad Keith, would visit a few times a week and help out with cleaning and other chores. We were very close to my grandma, and she was the quintessential grandma too. She had a snack drawer from when we came over, and definitely spoiled us. We weren't close with our dad's side of the family, and our stepdad's parents had passed, so grandma was all we had. Her house was older, but it was still in pretty good shape. She had a bedroom on the first floor since she had trouble going up the stairs, and my mom slept in her childhood bedroom on the second floor. When my sister Martha and I stayed over, we'd take sleeping bags and sleep on the floor, and it was kind of like camping, but usually we were at home with Keith. I remember very specifically that we had spent the weekend at Grandma's house and had a movie night. By this time, Grandma was a little out of it and very tired, but she still liked to dote on Martha and I and tell us stories. A lot of them were superstitious. She talked about how she had a baby who died a few months after being born and how the baby was still in the house with her. This kind of weirded Martha and me out, but our mom acted like it was normal, so we never said anything. But those kind of stories were common. So when Sunday came, we said goodbye to grandma and Keith picked us up to drive us a few miles back to our house. My mom was planning to stay until Monday morning when she had to go into work. She wanted to get some chores done at the house and make extra food for our grandma, who couldn't chew very well. Martha and I went home. We had dinner, we played outside for a while, and then we went to bed. Nothing seemed too off to us. The next morning, Keith told us in the kitchen that mom had brought grandma to the hospital because she wasn't doing well. I wasn't really sure how I felt about that because she'd been to the hospital a few times and always came home after. So it might not be serious, but at that age, when it's your first experience with someone being really sick, it can be confusing. We went to school, and when we got home, Keith picked us up and explained that he thought we should get flowers and some groceries from when Grandma came home. Mom had called him earlier and told him that they were planning on discharging her that afternoon. We stopped at the store quick, and then we went to Grandma's house. Mom was still at the hospital with her. So we let ourselves in and we set up the flowers and then just kind of hung out watching TV. Keith decided to clean up the yard a bit and left us in the house. It wasn't nighttime yet, but closer to evening for sure, maybe about five or six at night. Martha and I were starting to get hungry. To distract ourselves, we wandered around the house looking at grandma's things, old pictures of our moms and aunts and uncles and stuff like that. On the first floor, we heard a noise that sounded like it came from our grandma's room. The door was open, but 
but Martha said she was sure mom wasn't there yet. She had looked out the window upstairs, and the driveway was empty. I thought they might have arrived without us noticing, and I went to grandma's room to say hi to her. Martha followed me. When we got to the door, we looked in, and both saw grandma sitting in her rocking chair. She looked exactly the same as ever, but she didn't say anything to us. Instead, she was sort of staring off into the room. And then Martha and I heard a baby cry. It was very faint, but we both backed up into the living room and checked if each of us heard that. After listening for a minute, we didn't hear it again. Martha went to get Keith to tell him they were back, and I went to find Mom, thinking she was in the kitchen. But after checking the entire downstairs and running back upstairs, I didn't find her. Keith and Martha came inside within seconds. The house phone rang. It was one of those old school phones that hangs on the wall and has a really long cord. Keith picked it up and talked quietly for a little bit. When he hung up, he turned around and told us sadly that our grandmother had passed away at the hospital. They thought she had been doing better. It had actually been what they refer to as rallying, kind of a last ditch burst of energy before someone passes away. Mom had called the hospital to let us know, and when she didn't reach us at home, she tried Grandma's house. Martha and I looked at each other right away and told Keith we had seen Grandma in her room less than 10 minutes ago. He seemed skeptical. Keith wasn't a superstitious person, but he heard us out. When we were done explaining, he ducked into our room and checked and said no one was there. He then checked the rest of the house with us close behind, but we didn't see her again. Eventually, my mom came back from the hospital and we told her what happened too. Our theory as a family was that grandma passed away and her spirit came back to the house for a bit before moving on. The baby we heard must have been the baby that she lost and that she talked about sometimes. None of us ever saw anything in the house again and mom had sold it a few years later. But I like to think that grandma was finally reunited with her baby and found some peace. Since then, I've had other experiences, but I'll save those for another day. When you believe in certain things, you tend to notice a lot more than other people around you do. Hi Donovan, I've been listening to your channel for a while now. I really enjoy all the stories, and it makes me think about all the things that are happening around us that we don't know about or even understand. I haven't had much in the way of creepy or paranormal experiences in my lifetime, but my wife seems to be more in tune with the supernatural realm and has seen and felt many ghosts over the years. Anyhow, I do have one experience that still haunts me to this day, and I think about it every once in a while. It's in the early 1980s and I'm in the 10th grade. I play in the concert band and we're doing a performance at the school one evening in late fall. It all goes well and I'm walking home by myself afterwards. I would say it's around 10 p.m. The town that I grew up in has a bunch of walking paths. It's dark out but the paths are well lit and perfectly safe. I was not on high alert at all, just happily moseying my way home like any other day. I'm almost home, just one more gradual slope up a hill, over a bridge, turn right and I'm there. I reach the beginning of the long uphill slope to the bridge and I look up and I stop dead in my tracks with an eerie sense of dread. It takes a few seconds to process why. There is a man standing at the top of the hill, probably 50 yards away, just before where the bridge starts, and he's looking at me. It's not unusual to see people along this path. It's fairly well traveled during the day, but it's night and there's no one else around, just me and this guy. Then I realize what made me stop so suddenly. I can only see his silhouette as the lights from the road behind him outline his shape, but he's standing there akimbo with hands on his hips, and he's wearing a top hat. So all of this takes about a second to process, and I realize I'm just standing there at the base of the hill looking up at him. I can sense something that only can be described as pure evil. I know he's looking right at me, and for a brief moment I'm paralyzed. I can feel him looking at me. My rational brain takes over and I'm able to step off the path and move behind some trees to block his view of me. I quickly go through my options, keep walking up the path because obviously my mind is playing tricks on me. 
Either I saw something that wasn't there, or it's just some guy walking his dog, right? Okay, so I slowly peek out from behind the tree, and there he is, in the exact same spot, in the exact same stance, still looking directly at me, and still wearing that top hat. I could feel this pure sense of evil piercing through my core. Or I could do option two, run like hell. That's exactly what I did. To this day, I still regret running away. It bothers me that I'll never know exactly who or what was waiting for me at the top of the hill right before that bridge. Did it really happen? In my mind, absolutely. But I can't be sure. If it happened today, I would run up the hill towards him just so I could find out what it really was. If I ever see him again, I will. But it's been over 30 years and still no sign of him. Thanks again for all the great work you do. I know your listeners appreciate it very much. I am excited to finally be submitting my story. I've been hesitant to write in because I'm certain that once I do, there are people around my community that will instantly recognize who I am. And of course, that's when the ribbing will begin. I've decided though that I'm ready to face the jokes and the mockery if it means adding my voice to the chorus that makes up the true believers of the Jersey Devil. As an animal control officer, I've dealt with my fair share of weird phone calls over the years. Nothing will ever top the call I received on August 2nd of 2017 though, because that's the day I came to believe firmly in the beast in question. That morning when I first got to work, I had a note on my desk from a girl who worked dispatch. She scribbled down an address and wrote simply, Blind Woman Big Bird. I recognized the address right off and my mind was officially jogged by the reference to the blind woman. I'd been there a few weeks before because she had a similar complaint. Since the first call, I started taking notice when I drove by her house that the old woman spent a lot of time sitting out on her porch. I guess she liked the fresh air or the sounds of the outdoors. She had been sitting outside every time I had driven by since that first day. And that's where she was the first day I came by too. She had told me then that sometimes when she sits on her back porch, something very large flies close by the house and that the sound of its wings was very loud and had actually created enough wind to knock a book of braille poetry out of her hands. I didn't know that I believed the second part but I did know that certain species of birds of prey can be very large and sound even bigger than they really are. I searched the property after the first call, but found no sign of anything taking up residency and told her that more than likely it was a falcon or a hawk swooping down in her yard for a squirrel and she shouldn't be too concerned. Now staring at the note, I figured she'd heard it again. You know how sometimes you just know something is about to turn into a bigger ordeal than you want to deal with. That's exactly how I felt in that moment. I had dealt with her once before and she wasn't happy with my inability to fix the problem. I had no doubt in my mind that she was going to be equally upset when I came back out and had similar results. Still, it's my job. So I got my stuff together and drove to her house. When I got there, she wasn't sitting on her front porch though, as she usually did. Instead, she was sitting inside the house it was nearing dusk at the time, so I thought maybe she was just avoiding mosquitoes or getting ready to have dinner. She soon let me know that I was wrong, and she said, That thing swooped back down while I was out on the porch and knocked the book out of my hands again. I told her that sometimes large birds of prey will patrol certain areas, and that isn't uncommon to see one swoop the same place more than once. But nothing was living on her property as far as I could tell. It got my cat, she interrupted. I was stunned. But as sad as it was, there's nothing uncommon about a bird of prey swooping up a pet either. She pulled it off the porch, she said. Now that was something that I couldn't rationalize. As big and fearless as birds of prey are, they rarely risk interacting with people. If she had been sitting on that porch, there's no way one would have come up and grabbed the cat. I asked her to show me where she had been sitting and that's when I walked into a gruesome sight. I was glad the old woman couldn't see the blood and the fur smeared and splayed across the porch, or the deep scratches in the wood from claws or whatever had grabbed it. I asked her, did this thing make a sound, have a smell, anything else you can tell me? 
I couldn't imagine what we might be dealing with after seeing this mess it left in its wake. It smelled like sulfur, she said, and it was hot. There was heat rolling off of it. It was then that I saw feathers. Three or four large black feathers stuck out from between the planks of the back porch. I reached down and grabbed them, pulling them free. Each was at least two feet long. There's not a bird in the area they could have fallen off of. The old woman asked me, It's that damn Jersey Devil, isn't it? I could have assured her to the best of my ability that it wasn't. I could have come up with some other excuse as to what it could have been and save her from the terror. But I couldn't lie to an old woman. I told her that the Jersey Devil was the only reasonable explanation and that I didn't think she should sit on our porch alone anymore. A few weeks later, a young man came into the station and asked to speak to me. He introduced himself as the old woman's grandson and said he had set up a ring camera on the back porch, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever had been swooping back there. When he showed me the picture on his phone, there wasn't much mistaking what it was. A large black mass and two glowing eyes stared into the camera from the middle of the yard, as if it knew the camera was there watching it. I asked him to email it to me, but he never did. A few days later, the house had a for sale sign in the yard, and I never heard anything from those people again. I think I would have moved too. I really enjoyed listening to all the stories you post. I usually listen to them in the evenings when I have a fire going. I honestly never dreamed I would have a story to contribute though. A few years ago, I jumped on the van life trend. I was between jobs and I'd saved up enough money to be a free spirit for a while. I've always been adventurous and pictured myself traveling around the United States. I was finally able to buy a pop top van and then it felt like the whole world opened up to me. It took a while to get some repairs done on it and get everything I needed for an extended trip. But when I was ready, I started up in Washington State and I kept going down the coast of Oregon and California. My dream was to follow the sun so I would never really have to deal with winter temperatures. So when November came around, I had landed in Arizona. The sun felt so good. It was around 75 degrees out. I was used to freezing temperatures and snow by that time of year. I had never spent any time in Arizona, so I was really unfamiliar with the area. I was fascinated with the saguaro cactus, so I ended up going through the saguaro national park. The things were like 30 or 40 feet tall. I realized they were covered with these little spines and some of them had an incredible number of arms. They really seemed unworldly. Then, someone mentioned Coronado National Forest, and I thought I would camp there for a while. National forests are typically free to camp in, and I was trying to save money. I was planning to be there for several days. I arrived on a weekend and found myself a spot that looked good. There were a few other campers close by, which made me feel pretty comfortable. It was fun for me to just putter around my campsite and get situated. When I was ready to look around the area, I found a good trail and I set out. I really loved the terrain. I had grown up in a completely different area, so this was all new to me. I grew up in Colorado and I was used to the mountain life. This desert area was really enthralling to experience. It was a strange new land. After hiking a couple hours, I started to head back toward my campsite. Not long after I started walking back down the trail, something caught my eye in the middle of these trees. I could see this strange reptilian creature moving back and forth through the brush. I was so startled to see it, I just stared for a while, and then it turned its head and looked right at me with these piercing yellow eyes. I immediately started to walk at a fast pace toward my van. This creature was moving along as well, keeping its distance but still tracking me. This kept up for what seemed like 10 minutes, until I reached this clearing where I was parked. I got back to the campsite very shaken and nervous. All my years growing up in the mountains, I had never seen anything comparable to that. From what I could gather, it was very large, and it had stood up on its hind legs. It seemed to be about 5 feet tall when it was upright, and had these large black claws. It had a head like a lizard. The weird thing was, when it looked at me, it almost felt malicious. Obviously, I was a complete novice to the area and had no idea what lived there, but that did not seem right at all. 
I mean, surely I would have heard about a five foot tall lizard before. There would have to be some kind of information posted on that kind of a thing, right? The rest of the evening was very quiet and peaceful until around two in the morning when I heard what sounded like this strange mix of hissing and clicking. I had my windows open and it was loud enough to wake me up. I noticed a few other campers were outside looking. A couple of them came out and were milling around and talking as well. I went outside and I walked over to them. Someone said it was just some kind of insect or something, but that sound was not like anything else I've ever heard before. We listened for a while, but then the sound seemed to move away. I mentioned what I had seen earlier, and they looked at me like I was a little nuts. So it wasn't just me. The thing that I had seen wasn't anything anyone was familiar with. We eventually all went back to our RVs. I tried to sleep, but felt very uneasy. The next morning, I woke up around 8 a.m. When I stepped out of the van, a woman came to me and asked if I had heard these weird noises. I said that I did, and I had no idea what it was. The woman who was camping nearby said she heard of a few sightings of a lizard man recently. I have never heard of such thing, and if anyone had mentioned it before, I wouldn't have believed it at all. Well, after that, I just wanted to leave as soon as possible. Now, I'm not sure what to think. I decided that I would go ahead and head further east and try my luck in New Mexico. I tried to find information on this lizard man, but there isn't really much to go on. I thought you might want to get the word out there and see if any of your listeners have any ideas what this could have been. Hey there, Donovan. This took place when I was in the military. I was stationed at Camp Casey in South Korea. I was a truck driver and had the night shift for about two weeks. The roads were pretty empty at night. One night, I was driving down the road that ran parallel to the DMZ, which is where North Korea and South Korea meet. There are no towns or villages in this area, due to the fact that it is heavily guarded by both countries' military forces. This road runs from one end of Camp Casey to the other, about 10 miles long. I was driving along when my headlights caught something moving in front of me on the side of the road about 50 yards away. I slowed down and tried to focus on what I was seeing. It looked like a huge dog or a wolf running very fast. It had long hair and was moving at a pretty good pace. I thought it may have been a wolf that escaped from one of the zoos in Seoul, about an hour away. I watched this thing run across the road and disappear into the rice paddies. I came to a stop after I pointed my headlights off to the right of the road into the rice paddies where this thing was. I'm sitting there for maybe 20 seconds. Then I see this thing rise out of the rice paddies. I kid you not, it was the same wolf that I saw run across the road. The rice paddies are about three or four feet tall and this thing's torso started at the top of the rice paddies. It was there standing on two legs looking at me. Its eyes were reflecting in the headlights and looked all weird. I could tell it was looking at me trying to figure out its next move. I could see it turning its head like it was thinking on what to do next. It dropped back down and just took off. I couldn't see it after it moved out of the headlights. Craziest thing I've ever seen, Donovan. It was this dark gray color from what I could tell, and it had a big old head on it too. Hi Donovan, your channel was recently recommended to me and I've been listening almost every day to all the weird encounters that people have. It reminded me of something that happened to me back in the 90s and I never been able to explain it. I've always lived in an urban city in New York, but after graduating from college, I met someone with strong ties to the South. When our relationship got serious, I was asked to consider moving down to Georgia. I was reluctant to do that because I had kind of a stereotypic view of Southerners, but I was smitten enough to say yes to the move. I moved to the outskirts of Savannah, Georgia. There was quite a bit of culture shock, but I gradually got used to the area and fell in love with it. I think I even started to develop a Southern drawl. We eventually got engaged and started looking around at different areas, trying to decide where we might want to buy a new home. We wanted to stay pretty close to family. My fiance's family lived in a really old house. The history of the place was incredible. There was a lot of documented history about the house's old owners, 
and the activity surrounding the house. There are a lot of underground tunnels in the area. They're pretty much blocked off now for the most part though. But at one point, the house was a safe haven for slaves trying to flee from the south. The winter after I moved down there, my fiance's parents were going to visit relatives in Switzerland for a couple weeks. They asked if we would house sit. We were glad to help out. A few nights in, we were just staying home and having a quiet evening, since it was cold and sleeting a little outside, which is rare for the area. We weren't used to the weather being that cold. We went upstairs to get cozy and just gotten into bed when we heard this loud bang. It really startled us, but we figured it must be a door closing because of the wind. That was weird enough though, because we were in the habit of keeping all the doors closed since it was a drafty house. We turned the lights on and went downstairs. We looked all around. When we got to the dining room, we could not believe what we saw. It's one of those old fancy formal dining rooms. The table in there was completely set with place settings. I mean, everything was laid out. Cloth napkins, the nice old china, their heirloom silver, everything. It was a 10 person table and everything looked perfect. Like a dinner party was about to happen. But the thing is, the table was never set. Nobody uses that room except for a rare holiday now and then. The table was always empty except for a vase of artificial flowers in the middle. We started freaking out and looking around to see if someone had gotten in. My fiance tried to stay calm and decided to call the police. We were convinced there had to be an intruder hiding somewhere. We were waiting for the police and we went and checked the security system. It was still set. It would have gone off if a door or window was opened. When the police came, one officer did a search of every room in the house and one walked around the entire house. There were no signs at all that anyone had come up to the house or gotten inside. The police had nothing to go on. And to be honest, I thought they were looking at us kind of weird. Anyway, they finally took off. We were just left there in disbelief, trying to speculate what could possibly explain it. I never believed in ghosts, but I have no freaking idea what happened that night. It's really the strangest thing that I've ever experienced. My fiance actually called his parents since it was morning in Switzerland by then. His mom said the tableware was definitely not out before. She said she couldn't even remember the last time she used the formal china. His parents were really worried that someone was hiding in the house. We assured them that the police had been through every room and checked everywhere. There wasn't much else we could do about it, so we thought we would just put everything away and try to get some sleep. But first, my fiance got out the Polaroid that his dad always kept in the kitchen and took a photo just to document the weirdness of the night. We got everything back in the cabinets and went back to bed. I kept hearing every little sound and it was hard to fall asleep, but I eventually did. When we came down the next morning, of course the first thing we did was look in the dining room. Thank God nothing was out of place. I saw the Polaroid picture laying there that we had forgotten about. I picked it up and looked at how crazy the table looked with all that china on it. Then in the corner of the photo I saw this blur. Like how it looks if you're trying to take a picture of something running by really fast. I looked at that corner of the room and there was nothing there to suggest any movement would have been picked up. For some reason I got the chills running up and down my spine when I saw that. My fiance agreed there was no explanation for it at all. As far as I know, nothing else strange has ever happened in the house to the family. I don't understand why on that one strange night those spirits or whatever they were tried to freak us out like that. I really avoided that room after that. I only found your channel about a month ago or so, but I really wanted to thank you for it. It makes me feel better to be able to listen to other people's experiences. When I was a kid, I lived in Southern Ohio. Me and my sister had a babysitter who lived near the woods. We were really close in age, so we were probably 9 and 10 years old at the time. One day in the summer, we were playing outside with a couple of other kids who were babysat there too. I don't remember why exactly, but we ended up getting in a big argument with them over the rules of a game or something. Anyway, my sister and I refused to keep playing with them, so we decided to go pick some flowers that grew at the edge of the forest. We wanted to get a bouquet to give to our babysitter. There were these gorgeous white flowers that we loved. 
We thought they were Queen Anne's lace, but we came to find out later that it was poison hemlock. We knew we weren't really supposed to be over there so close to the woods, but we figured we'd just hang out there for a bit, then go right back. We somehow got onto the neighbor's property while we were picking those flowers. We noticed a path leading into the woods, and for some reason, we decided to check it out and see where it led. There was nothing special about the path except for the fact that we didn't know where it went. There were lots of spots where it was overgrown, and you really had to duck under branches to get through. After a while, we came to this little bridge, but the creek bed under it was dried up. We kept going beyond the bridge, and eventually we came to a clearing with stones all around it in a circle. Right in the middle of the circle was a huge stone well. We had never actually seen a well before. There were stairs built into the inside walls of the well that spiraled down. My sister found a rock and tossed it in, but we never heard it hit the bottom. I don't know if the well was dry or if the well was so deep that we couldn't hear the rock splash. We started looking around for more rocks to throw in. I was looking around in the bushes at the edge of the clearing and found these huge stones embedded in the ground. Then I realized there was writing on them, like names and dates cut into the stones. It took me a minute to realize they were gravestones. They were in some sort of graveyard in the middle of the woods, far away from anyone. I started getting chills when I realized that. Then my sister appeared beside me really quietly and poked me. She pointed to the edge of the clearing on the other side of the well. She was pointing at a dark shape standing just inside the woods facing us. She whispered to me that it had come up the stairs of the well. I stood up very slowly and stared at this dark shape. My sister grabbed my hand and tried to get me to leave, but I couldn't move. It was like I was actually paralyzed by fear. I couldn't take my eyes off this creature. It didn't move at all until some clouds came over and the clearing became slightly shadowy. Then the shape moved. It was the size of a human adult to me. It looked like it was covered in black feathers. It turned its head toward us and seemed to look right through me with these freakishly weird red eyes. Then it lifted up these big black wings and jumped into the tree behind it. It was perching on a branch like some giant bird out of a nightmare. We finally both turned and ran as fast as we could, back the way we had come. My sister was faster than me, so she made it to the bridge first, but I wasn't too far behind. We ran over the bridge and found the original path, and then I looked back and saw that thing standing there at the edge of the bridge, just standing there. I screamed and kept running. I tripped over the root in the path and ripped my pants and tore my knee, but I just got up and kept running. We burst out of the trees screaming and crying and ran into the house. Our babysitter tried to calm us down and said, there was nothing like that in the woods, but it just made us more hysterical and determined to convince her. I don't even know what finally calmed us down. It took both of us a long time before we'd ever go back on the deck again. Everyone was convinced that we had made up a story with our hyperactive imaginations. When I got older, I sort of tried to make sense of what we saw as some kind of weird psychological reaction to picking hemlock. But the fact that my sister and I had the same exact experience made no sense at all. I know what I saw was real. I probably don't remember all the details exactly since it happened almost 40 years ago, but I'll never forget the level of fear that I had. I have a scar on my knee from when I fell so hard that day. I guess it's a good reminder that there are strange, unexplainable things in this world, and that I should probably have a healthy respect for the unknown. I don't live in fear or anything now, but I tend to believe people who have strange stories to tell. At the risk of everyone knowing who I am when they hear this story, I'm going to go ahead and tell it publicly, because I think it's worth sharing with a wider audience than my friends and family. In 2020, following my divorce, I bought a tiny house in the small town of Bradley, South Dakota. It wasn't much, just a one-bedroom, one-bathroom, cottage-type home, across the alley from an old church that had long since quit holding service and started falling apart. Bradley is a very small town with a Mayberry-type feel. Everyone knows everybody. The kids and dogs run the streets freely, without anyone bothering too much with them. 
There's even an old woman a couple blocks over with a pet peacock that runs wild with the kids. When you envision a small, weird little town in the middle of nowhere, it's Bradley, South Dakota. So I wasn't expecting much trouble on that day that I moved in. In fact, the first few weeks that I was there were pretty boring. Nothing happened at all. I spent the time fixing the house up just how I like it, and literally, in some cases, watching paint dry. It was my 10th night in the house when I first saw the little girl. I was watching TV in the living room and heard something shuffling around in the hallway. I couldn't imagine what it might be and thought maybe one of those free range kids or dogs had made its way in through the back door so I got up to go check it out. She didn't look like she was more than three or four years old. She was filthy, covered in dirt from head to toe, and her hair was matted and twisted up in clumps. The only clean thing on her were two streams down her face where the tears had washed the dirt away. She startled me when I first saw her. Then I got concerned. I hadn't seen that kid before, and whoever she was wasn't being cared for properly, if her appearance was any indication. I asked her, honey, what's your name? But she didn't respond. She just kept staring at me blankly, almost fearfully like she couldn't tell if I was a good person or a bad one. I tried talking to her again. I asked, are you hurt? And she wouldn't tell me. I went back to the living room to get my phone, and when I came back, she was gone. I called the local sheriff and made a report, hoping he'd be able to tell me something, or maybe even come out and find the girl. Strangely, he didn't seem all that surprised what I was telling him. He just told me not to worry about it and go on to bed. The same thing happened three or four times a week from that point on. I tried taking a photo of her with my phone one night, but she ran away the second she saw me point that thing at her. It was like she knew what I was trying to do, and she didn't want to be identified. Finally, I started asking other neighbors about the little girl, and if they knew anything. Most of them acted like I was absolutely crazy. A few, though, seemed to know who I was talking about, but acted very much like the sheriff, telling me not to worry and that they were sure she was just fine, whoever she belonged to. I decided the only way to make it stop was to buy a new lock for the back door. I had been locking the door, but the house had been there and had the same key for God knows how long. A new lock, I thought, might take care of the kid being able to run in and out, especially if she somehow had a copy of the keys from the past tenant. The new lock seemed to work. I didn't see her for about two weeks. Then one night, I was startled awake by something cold touching my face. When my eyes opened, the little girl was standing there by my bed and jumped backwards, every bit as frightened as I was. She took off running out the door quicker than I could get out of bed. This time, I was determined to get an answer about who she was. I wasn't going to continue to live this way. I drove down to the sheriff's station myself and asked to speak to him in person. When I told him who I was and that I needed an answer about this kid, he looked reluctant to tell me anything. Then he finally, I guess, decided there was no point in covering it up anymore. He admitted he didn't know her name, who she was or who she belonged to, but that he had been getting calls about her for years. Now that didn't make any sense to me because she wasn't old enough to have been causing trouble for years. I imagine she was just finally old enough to turn a doorknob herself. So I told him I didn't believe a word of what he was saying. If she had been around for years, she's a damn ghost, I said. That's when he raised his eyebrows at me, and I knew that that is exactly what he was trying to imply. It took a while, but I did finally figure out her name. I visited every library in the Tri-County area, sifting through old newspapers until I finally came across an article from 1910. A little girl who lived right on the same property I now live on had apparently died of scarlet fever and been buried in the churchyard behind the house. For days after her death, her mother would sit outside, saying she could hear the girl crying. At first, everyone said it was the crazy hallucinations of a grieving mother. Finally, though, the mother insisted that they dig her baby back up to check. They obliged, thinking one final look at her daughter's body might help her make peace with the loss. When they did dig up the girl, though, they found her flipped over on her stomach, her hands twisted up in her hair and her poor little fingernails clawed right off into the wood casket. She had been buried alive, 
and come back awake after some time. The wailing her mother had heard was really her. She came back around one more time after I learned who she was. I called her by her real name. I called her by her real name, Rachel, and told her that I was sorry she woke up scared and alone, but that if she had let go of this place, she could pass on and be with her mommy and daddy in the world that comes after this one. She wiped the tears from her eyes and smiled at me and skipped away. I haven't seen her since.